And I also have uh, on this title slide a, a link to the website that I maintain to support um, my travels in uh, using development tools and integration middleware and specifically BPM. Um, that website, uh, ibmbpmdemos.com, uh, looks like the following. It's a, a space on the ibm.com uh, developerworks wiki area. And what we see there is a link to downloadable resources like white papers and the slides uh, that I'm using today in my PowerPoint presentation, as well as a video wall to um, uh, advertise some of the primary uh, tutorial demos that are live recorded walkthroughs of uh, BlueWorks Live and IBM VPM end to end. And I'm adding um, some things there this month, uh, some new version 8 uh, walkthroughs of IBM VPM. Uh, so you can go here to uh, get reinforcement and follow on coverage of the, um, uh, the content we're covering today. So uh, don't forget about IBM BPM demos.com. So let me go ahead and uh, highlight for, I know that we have a, a mixed crowd today. Uh, by mixed crowd, what I mean is that we have um, a number of folks that are familiar with IBM BPM. Uh, so I will briefly cover up front some of the highlights on version 8, which we uh, shipped in the uh, in the May-June time frame of this year. Um, and, and then I'll <clears throat> go through the primary coverage and we'll revisit this at the end in uh, slightly more detail. So um, as uh, this platform has been in use at customers for the last uh, uh, 10, 11 years, um, we've gone through multiple releases. Uh, in the version 8 release, we have a, a focus on um, social uh, collaboration and you'll see that in the end user experience of the process portal as well as the design time developer experience of IBM BPM. Um, we added uh, iOS apps that run on iPhone, iPad, iPod um, with, uh, uh, with no um, custom development needed. And the APIs that we used to uh, create those iOS apps that you can download from the Apple App Store um, actually, it's one iOS app. Uh, a couple iOS apps. You, you can use that API, that REST API, to build your own custom um, mobile applications uh, that work with IBM BPM. And we've actually published on our BPM wiki, um, our community wiki, the example uh, code that is used to build that app as an exemplar app uh, for you to leverage. We've added significant... Um, visual as well as functional and programmatic enhancements to version 8 of BPM that uh, enable us to enable you to integrate to enterprise content management systems, IBM and non-IBM. And uh, we have added significant um, geographically dispersed capabilities for federating uh, and sharing uh, content in the um, one of the top 10 uh, unique aspects of IBM BPM, which is the process center, um, and enhanced other governance-related change management and teaming capabilities of IBM BPM. Uh, so those are just some of the highlights. As, as you notice in the upper right-hand corner of this slide, uh, those are some of the enhancement areas. Uh, these plus 295 other enhancements. Um, so version 8 was a, quite a significant release for us, uh, especially since it a lot of the enhancements focused on um, the the visual, you know, face of the end user experience. Um, so let me go ahead and spend some time on the primary coverage of uh, IBM BPM in action, uh, and that will be of value for both folks that um, have used uh, or seen BPM in the past and want to see what it looks like in version eight, as well as folks that have never seen IBM BPM. So. Um, uh, for from a level set standpoint, um, where we're focused is to deliver um, build from scratch capabilities that result in a very unique application in as little or less time than it takes to roll out a packaged application. So a best of both worlds approach that uh, enables you to build something very custom in a short amount of time. That's it, focused on human to human and human to system interactions in a business process in a way that the BPM platform uh, orchestrates those human-human and human-assistant interactions to uh, 
uh, automate and streamline, um, increase uh, quality, uh, lower error rates, provide real-time visibility and uh, control over the end-to-end -end process uh, with expected business process management um, uh, sweet spot benefits, including um, uh, a notable amount of business rule capability, uh, not full-blown business rule management system capability, but just enough uh, business rule capability to bake into the process, um, process uh, rules that represent tribal knowledge in people's heads that uh, make sense to uh, include as a part of the, the process uh, flow. The essential capabilities that uh, we leverage throughout design time, run time, the end user experience, and include those inventoried here so that what the BPM platform is doing uh, in orchestrating um, via that, that third layer, if you will, the human-human and human-system uh, interactions, and the system-to-system -system interactions to a notable degree, is we leverage the ability to model both for modeling uh, uh, documentation <clears throat> as well as modeling for execution. As you'll see, uh, we can run the process model at any time regardless of how much or how little has been implemented. Uh, we monitor the process end-to-end -end, um, so that we can uh, get as an automatic byproduct visibility and clarity on what's happening when and where with hotspots and focus on uh, where potential optimization um, hotspots are. Uh, we leverage rules, manage business data, deal with documents and events inbound and outbound, integrate to uh, literally anything in the IT landscape, and do that in a very collaborative way that delivers the right kind of analytics to business and IT. So <clears throat> when we look at how that's done, uh, it's done in a very uh, roles-based, rapid, agile, and iterative fashion. Uh, where we're sharing this process model across the entire life cycle of a business process application. And uh, if you uh, join the call, and you, if you could put yourself on mute with uh, star six, that would be great. Um, and, uh, uh, and so it, we'll take a look at the um, process modeling experience. Uh, and yeah, yeah, we might want to uh, hit star seven eight again for the latecomers to the call. Um, okay, so I'm back. Um, so let's go ahead and take a, a bit of a tour of this. If we take a look at um, if we take a look at IBM uh, BPM's process designer, uh, you'll notice that in the um, uh, in the upper right hand corner. Uh, there is a, uh, a run button uh, that runs the, the process or any part of the process that we build out. We, we like to call that a playback button because the spirit is that <clears throat> we can play back to the business and IT stakeholders the, what it is that we're working on at any time. Uh, it, it, as a matter of fact, the, the rule of thumb is that, that we do this before lunch on the first day um, because... Uh, if we don't do it before lunch on the first day when we're modeling and building out a business process, then we're missing an opportunity to do this in, a, in an iterative, uh, agile uh, fashion. Uh, you'll notice that the, the process designer allows us to draw out a, um, uh, a process. It has a BPMN, Business Process Modeling Notation Palette. And when we use this to uh, draw the picture of a process, we can... Um, not only draw uh, an evolving understanding of the process, but we can also <clears throat> we can also uh, uh, leverage and access existing um, uh, existing um, uh, enterprise assets. Uh, so, uh, as an example, if we take a look at um, uh, if we take a look at uh, Uh, for instance, the uh, list of reusable toolkits here on the left-hand side, you notice that I have, uh, as one example, <coughs> uh, Enterprise SOA Services. This is an example of where we would surface anything from the IT landscape, existing integrations, database interactions, enterprise service bus integrations, business rules, back-end systems of record. So anything that we can get to in the IT landscape, whether it be uh, via APIs or via web services 
uh, or, or JEE, -E, uh, we can surface those in this toolkit area and then visually drag and drop them out into the process. And when we do so, um, then we make it straightforward to wire that into the process and, um, and then uh, keep track of where and what is going on. And what I mean by that is if we take a look at uh, what is underneath this, you'll notice that in the case of this uh, back-end uh, integration, that if I double-click on that, uh, we see that it connects to a back-end system of record. It interacts with a database, a data warehouse, a web service, uh, and then updates that back-end system of record. You notice that this is read-only because somebody else built it. Somebody else on my, uh, on my development team, on my um, extended uh, IT uh, team built this and uh, made it available to me as a reusable component in my reusable component library over here. You notice that I have a, an advertisement that there's a new version of this available. Um, I can either upgrade to that new version when, it, uh, when someone makes a new version available or look at the version that I'm currently at, which is version 8.0, and in this case, upgrade to version 9.0. Uh, you notice that when I do that, it's immediately available. Let me do that again just to make sure nobody missed that. Change the version from 9.0 to 8.0, and you'll see that it's different. Right? So the point is, from a development and test standpoint, I can very easily, uh, very quickly, immediately in fact, um, col collaborate and access reusable components and then weave them into my business process. Now, as I was drawing out this business process and, and included this, this IT you know, system integration, um, and, and I'll, uh, uh, I'll visit some other parts of the process, like, for instance, uh, this um, activity called manager escalation. If we take a look at this manager escalation activity, we can see here that um, it consists of one screen. If I take a look at that one screen and drill down into it, uh, this is what that one screen looks like. If I, if I press that, that run button, that playback button, we can see that th this one screen um, uh, looks like the following. Uh, we've got a, a box down here. Um, I'll say, hello, uh, please uh, get this done quickly. I'll make sure I spell quickly a little bit better. And uh, let's say that as we're working with the um, process stakeholders, the business and IT folks that understand the process, uh, we decide that we'd really rather have this, this box, uh, this comments area uh, up towards the top of the screen. Uh, when we do that um, and uh, either refresh the, the screen or press that, that run button again, you can see it, it, it moves. Right? So let's move this again. Let's move it to the bottom right corner of the screen. And alternatively, we just press the playback button. Uh, whether we press the, the, the run button, the playback button, or we refresh the, the web browser, we can see that, that, that this moves. Um, so let's go ahead and move this again and, uh, uh, and, uh, and try that out. I'll move it from the bottom right to the bottom left. And we can see that, um, that it's immediately available for, uh, you know, for quickly uh, moving around. So th this immediate gratification or this always runnable capability of um, the playback means that we're able to more easily um, collaborate with business and IT. Perhaps um, uh, the IT practitioners uh, like myself um, focused on using a tool like this to quickly collaborate with the business to build something, uh, something out like a, a business process flow. Uh, now, there's more to it than just a, the user interface. This is just one example. If we take a look at the business process itself, um, we can see that this run button at the business process level uh, lets us do the same thing, but at the process level. So if I click this run button at the process level, you can see that it highlights for me where I am in the process. Uh, I'm in the analyst swim lane at the create order activity. Um, I have clarity on that. I can see that there are multiple orders that are in flight multiple orders that are uh, in flight uh, in this list of process instances in the top left. And, um, and I can see in the top right uh, the activity that I'm, uh, that I'm sitting at. Uh, so if I, uh, uh, what I'm trying to explain here is that when I press that run button at the process level, uh, it switches from the um, designer perspective 
uh, to the inspector perspective. And it gives me a clear picture of which instance of the process I'm running, the step I'm at, and it even highlights it in the process for me. So if I just continue stepping through this, uh, I can see that uh, for this activity, uh, there's a, a user interface that's, that's built out for it. Um, if when using the business process as a designer or developer, I want a, uh, a better um, understanding or a more flexible ability to jump around the process, uh, I could do a number of things. Um, like, for instance, there's a, a timer event that's, uh, that's added, to this, been added to this activity essentially decorating this activity with a, a, an escalation pattern that says if this activity uh, takes more than um, an hour, in other words, if an analyst takes more than an hour to create an order, then I'm going to escalate this to a manager to help nudge it along. So we can see here that that uh, timer activity that looks like the clock is configured to be uh, one hour. Uh, so we get the desired behavior, right? That if an analyst takes too long to create an order, it's, it's going to get escalated to this manager escalation activity. Well, if I'm building this out and collaborating with the business uh, to to uh, uh, to build and test and experiment to play this back frequently, um, I can uh, use this inspector perspective to do things like fire this timer instead of sitting here for an hour and waiting for that to expire. I can actually have full control over the environment and, uh, and do that uh, at any point in time, do that at a moment's notice. As I just did here, you can see now it's progressed to the manager escalation. We have an inventory of where we've been in this process, the create order, the manager escalation. And if we continue stepping through this process, you can see here's that screen where I move the planner comments to the upper left-hand portion of, uh, of the user interface. So uh, in the process designer, we have this ability to play back the process at any time, no matter how much or how little has been implemented. We can integrate to custom built activities like the ones I was working with, as well as existing systems uh, like this back end system integration uh, that I highlighted a, a few minutes ago. Uh, we, can, um, we can also run the process at any level, the process level or lower levels. And just to, uh, be, before we move on to using this process um, not only from the process designer but from the end user perspective of the process portal uh, let me just drill down into this create order activity to show you that um, there are more possibilities for uh, orchestrating the end user experience. What I mean by that is you notice that in this manager escalation activity that I was using for uh, simple playback um, illustrations that I have one yellow box, one screen in the diagram view. Uh, if I double click on that <coughs> screen, that yellow box, it switches to the coaches tab. Uh, we call these user interface coaches because the spirit is we want to coach people through participating in the process. Um, well, these coaches or screen flows <coughs> can be more elaborate than just you know one or more screens. We can actually, as is the case with this uh, create order activity, have multiple screens. And you notice that these screens are, you know, varietal with uh, uh, different layouts. We can actually now build in version 8 component uh, screens. In other words, each element on this screen can be a composite control that we build out uh, and then uh, place on our tab. So you notice here that uh, in this, um, in the palette on the right, in addition to controls like buttons and checkboxes and images and so forth, we can also add our own controls to the palette. So um, this order control is an example of uh, this one over here. If I double click on it on the user interface, I drill down into that composite UI control, which is actually made up of uh, several other things. So we can nest uh, in <coughs> a composite fashion controls. And when we build those uh, user interface controls using primitive elements like buttons and fields, and craft a custom control like order details, then we can tag it. In this case, I haven't tagged it, so it shows on my, my palette as no tags. Uh, and then use it, advertise it, uh, and reuse it on, on my palette. And when I drag and drop that out, as you can see in the case here, um, it, uh, it, it, dra it drops that composite control. So um, huge possibilities. Uh, I'm sure you can imagine the range of possibilities uh, at our fingertips now to build reusable components, um, in this case, 
uh, uh, visual or um, uh, uh, the user experience, uh, build out that, that palette of reusable components. Now, those show up on individual user interface screens. We orchestrate these screens into screen flows. Um, so we switch from the coach's view of the individual screens to the diagram view of the screen flow. And we can see here that uh, in the case of, for instance, this gray box, we can put service calls um, uh, out onto the canvas. And in the case of this one, we're going to go call a service. Uh, could be a database interaction, could be a web service call, could be a custom backend system integration. Really doesn't matter uh, in, the, in that I can uh, uh, divide and conquer and someone can build this out. In this case, you can see it happens to be a database interaction. Um, and then I can reuse it by dragging and dropping it out onto uh, the canvas here. So if I go out here and look for it, uh, get uh, VEND, there it is. So I just typed part of it. I can drag and drop it out into uh, my screen flow like uh, we did over here and call it whatever I want, get available vendors. Um, we can see that this is actually the component called get vendors. Um, and that's what was done right here. Uh, so we're going to get a list of available vendors from a back-end system before we display it onto the select vendor screen. Um, and let's not lose sight of the fact that like we build, uh, we can build reusable uh, user interface components, composite UIs, we can also build reusable services, as was the case here, and we can use them anywhere. I can drag and drop this uh, get vendors integration component out onto the, um, uh, the process landscape as well. So whether we do this at a lower level of sub-processes, at a lower level of activity implementation, like we did here with this create order activity, and getting a list of available vendors before we need to display it on the screen, or we need to do it at the process level, we can drag and drop these reusable components uh, um, anywhere uh, throughout our process. Now, um, when I'm working on this, uh, let me go ahead and use this snapshot. Uh, the snapshot capability enables us to version our work uh, in, uh, in, in such an easy way that people will actually version their work. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, uh, straightforward and quick way of, of managing your changes. And we can do this across design time and runtime. So let me go ahead and, and name this uh, version 8.5, um, today's uh, uh, demo. Uh, and I could have comments if I want. You notice when I version it, it puts it at the top of the list in the lower left-hand corner here. Uh, if I go back in time to version uh, 8.4, <clears throat> you can see that um, I have different uh, 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 I have different elements on my process as a, a clear indication that this is a different version. Um, if I uh, go back to version 8.0, we can see that there's nothing in the upper right hand corner, nothing in the lower left hand corner. And if I go back to uh, today's demo version. Uh, you can see there it is. Now I can run any <clears throat> any one of these because I'm actually connected to a shared process model. So let's let's check in with that. Um, we're connected to a shared process model, um, which means that whether we're designing and testing with that that run button, that playback button, we're using it as uh, an end user community, or we're analyzing it for hot spots and bottlenecks and changing over time. We're always using a single version of the truth, a shared process model that is um, being served up by the component of IBM BPM called Process Center. So now let me give you uh, an example of that. I, I gave you one example right now where we're able to um, uh, we're able to uh, uh, access versions very quickly. We can actually run those versions immediately um, uh, without having to wait for anything being loaded because we're pointing at the process center. We're pointing at the process center. The application that we see the picture of that we drag and drop together is sitting where it needs to be to immediately run. So we can in, indeed immediately run it. Um, <clears throat> uh, the other key aspects of sharing uh, that process model using the process center they include a couple of key capabilities. And, and one of those is the idea that we can collaborate very easily. It's also, this is also good, I would call it academic illustration of what's really going on here. Um, I have two process designers uh, shown in the web conference right now. 
Um, <clears throat> the one in the top uh, shows that I'm logged on as Bill Hahn. The one in the bottom, and, and, and Bill can see that Ray, another developer on the team, is connected and looking at this process app. In the bottom half of my screen, which is uh, another instance of process designer, we can see Ray is logged on. Now, I'm showing you on a single screen what we would normally see on two different laptops, perhaps um, being used by people in you know, different buildings somewhere else in our, our enterprise. So now let's go ahead and use this. <clears throat> uh, Ray can see that Bill is logged in and he's been touching several different artifacts in the process. Now when Bill starts making a change to the process, because we're connected to and sharing the same process model, um, Ray can actually see immediately uh, that Bill is actually editing that. So as a team member, I have clarity on what's going on. Bill's editing it and um, <clears throat> the process model is automatically, um, think of it as a dynamic checkout. Uh, it's automatically locked at the high level of the process model so that Ray can't accidentally change the process while Bill is editing it. Now, never fear, um, you can edit multiple levels of the process uh, and the development team at the same time. In other words, uh, John could be editing a user interface on Activity 1. Anupam could be editing a user interface on Activity 5. I could be editing the process flow. <clears throat> Excuse me, and Jerry could be editing the rules in this integration component and the process. There's, we could make, be making multiple changes simultaneously at different levels and components of the process. If we happen to be looking at the same level, like is this case with Bill and Ray, uh, of the process, the high-level process, um, we are, uh, is a risk reduction automatic uh, feature of, of the process designer, um, automatically uh, locked from doing that so we can't accidentally change it. Now watch what happens when, when Bill hits Control S or clicks this, this Save button in the, in the top of the screen. Um, Ray switched back to Read Write, we can see, and Ray sees the changes to the process. When Ray makes a change to the process and hits uh, Control S, uh, Bill can immediately see uh, the changes to the process. So <clears throat> in my opinion, this is a good um, illustration of what's really going on behind the scenes. Because we're connected to the same shared process model, uh, there is the opportunity to, um, to do things like real-time collaboration, uh, like access multiple versions of a process app uh, in um, a second or two, and immediately be able to run any version of a process application. So from a, a design standpoint or development and test standpoint, um, this is uh, some people would call uh, ultimate, ultimate flexibility to, to, really, uh, um, to really do rapid, agile, iterative development. So that's a good, um, I think that's pretty good coverage of the fundamental building block capabilities of um, a process designer, the, the actual drawing ability, the implementation capability of um, weaving things from the uh, IT landscape, uh, the user interface landscape, uh, and the workflow landscape. Um, and uh, some of the things that we've updated in version 8 include um, the activity wizard uh, um, elaboration on uh, what you can quickly um, implement, user tasks, system tasks, decision tasks, uh, sub-processes, uh, an enhanced wizard to help you um, go through the task of implementing these activities in the process. A simplified BPMN palette on the right-hand side. So for those of you that have used version uh, prior versions of, of, of IBM BPM, uh, you'll notice that it's, uh, it's consolidated and when we drag and drop elements out onto the canvas, uh, then we can optionally choose in the property sheet um, different kinds of uh, elements. Uh, if we drag an intermediate event out onto the landscape, you'll notice that intermediate events can be a number of different kinds of events. That's how I got that timer uh, activity that I can use to decorate an activity with some sort of an escalation pattern. Um, so just be aware that the BPMM palette has been changed and simplified to regain a, a bit of real estate in our drawing canvas uh, and then you have to visit the property sheet to, uh, to, to get after things. <clears throat> now, let's use this same process from the process portal. In other words, I can choose to expose a process uh, to any group of users. So users that are in the group of analysts 
uh, are able to start this process, which kind of makes sense here because in the analyst swim lane, we have this create order activity that is uh, um, intended to be uh, able to be started manually. So let me go through an example scenario of that. Um, uh, and this is using the new process portal. Uh, so if uh, if we have um, a couple of users here, on the left-hand portion of my screen, we have uh, Beth. Uh, and on the right-hand portion of the screen, we have Bill. Um, now, uh, I'm doing this with Firefox and Safari web browsers. This would normally be happening in geographically dispersed parts of our enterprise. Uh, maybe Bill's in Chicago and Beth is in Hong Kong, just as an example. So Beth, um, uh, she's obviously, I guess, there on international assignment. So Beth is, uh, is going to create a new order. We can see order fulfillment shows up on her list of processes that she can create instances of, or you know, maybe in business terms, list of things she can do. Uh, so let's create an order. Uh, when Beth creates an order, she sees that screen that we saw before. Um, she notices that uh, there's a list of experts. In other words, IBM BPM in version 8 uh, tracks the people that use the process um, the most. And so we get this automatic accumulation of people on my team that have used the process the most. Uh, the, the ones in the top portion of the list uh, are automatically recommended. The ones in the bottom portion of the list are configurable by you when you define the process model uh, and administer the process application. So uh, in this case, it, it can happen uh, completely automatically with zero programming effort. Um, so she just uh, clicked on Bill Hahn and asked to collaborate with Bill. On the right half of my screen, you know, on, uh, across the world, uh, Bill sees a request to collaborate, and when Bill clicks on that, he's taken to the same screen that Beth is on. And you can see that when Beth clicks on fields in this screen, uh, that uh, Bill sees uh, where she is. So Beth is uh, clicked on this field on the screen, and on Bill's web browser, he can see a, 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 uh, a subtle, you know, uh, fading advertisement of where Beth is. Now, um, when Beth types something in a field, Bill can see what Beth typed show up in his web browser. And if Beth so chooses to uh, allow Bill to take control of the screen, she can do that. And now when Bill navigates the user interface, Beth can see where Bill is at uh, in the user interface. So this real-time collaborative editing is a new capability in uh, version 8 of our um, process portal end user experience. It's actually from a technology and a, uh, I would say, you know, solution architect and designer point of view. It's based on a very powerful new feature in version 8 called, um, from a technical standpoint, shared objects. So the, the shared object architecture that we have added to version 8 uh, enables you to use what some people might think of as a, a global variable. It's a bit more sophisticated than that, but essentially what it allows us to do is to share within a process and across processes um, uh, data, uh, which means that if you have, say, parallel paths in a process, um, you can uh, share the same business uh, object model, the same business data, so it makes it easier for us to uh, orchestrate things and share data. We happen to use it in an innovative way here to uh, um, share uh, data uh, related to the end user experience uh, across multiple people. Um, so at any rate, uh, just a little bit of a side note on an interesting uh, version 8 enhancement uh, that you don't want to miss from a solution architect standpoint. So let's continue the journey here where, where Bill is coaching Beth through uh, how to complete this screen. You can see when Bill visits parts of the screen, even clicking on a button, uh, Beth sees the advertisement of where Bill is. Bill just clicked on that button. Uh, and now when Bill switches to the next screen, Beth can see where Bill has switched to. Uh, Bill's going to go ahead and choose a few vendors to uh, uh, send a quote out to for this order fulfillment. And when he finishes the screen, it takes Bill back to his inbox. We can see Bill has one item in his inbox. And it takes Beth back to her inbox, uh, her work uh, queue, where she has many things to, to work on. Um, so that's one of the uh, heralded new features of, of version 8. Um, gives you a glimpse of the process portal. Let me show you a little bit more of that process portal and user experience um, by, uh, by going there right now. In, in the process portal, one of the things we've added to both the process portal and the process center, let me switch to the process center, which I can get to either from the Eclipse development tool, process designer, or from the web browser interface. 
from either, whether you're in the Eclipse tool, Process Designer, or in the web interface, um, we can get to the Process Center in, in the Eclipse tool with this icon in the upper right-hand corner. In the Process Center, we've added a search engine, which enables me to, uh, for instance, look for and search for uh, uh, process artifacts. So if I take a look at, uh, um, you know, search for order, uh, now I'll get a search back that shows me, um, very consistent with the view of Process Designer, a categorized uh, search match for um, different kinds of artifacts. Uh, human services, decisions, integration services, uh, or all of the artifacts. And, and so the, the point is, from a web interface uh, or the Eclipse tool, I can very, in a rich fashion, use a Lucene-based search to um, search for my, um, my process artifacts. And, and I'm just touching the surface. There's actually a lot of different um, richness built into the uh, search uh, engine from a design time and a runtime end user experience standpoint. There's tags, for instance, you can use um, if you have process variables and, and other specific artifacts you're looking for. You can use specific uh, tag names with, uh, uh, with colons and, and, and so forth to narrow your search. So make sure you visit the IBM uh, BPM Information Center or Info Center to, to get some of those details and I've included them in my presentation as well. Let's look at this search from the point of view of the end user experience in the process portal. If I look at my inbox I can see as Bill Hahn I have 42 things in my inbox. My inbox is, is automatically organized uh, by uh, tasks that are overdue, at risk, do today, do later this week, kind of a you know getting things done type organization based upon my um, uh, my due dates. So automatically organized. Um, now as I have 44 things in my inbox, uh, uh, I can search for things that say are, are related to account opening. And we can see I have five activities related to account opening. If I want to use some of these activities, I can see some of the highlights of the details of these tasks. Um, uh, by just clicking on the activity. If I'd like to see <clears throat> some of the details of these tasks, I can drill down into, uh, say, a process diagram uh, or a uh, uh, instance details, um, which I'll do in a moment. Uh, if we happen to have a, uh, um, an activity that is really laser-focused on approval, we have a new feature in Process Designer that lets you configure an activity to be an inline approval. Uh, so I can do something as simple as provide some comments and then click an approve button. So in other words, I don't have to actually open up an activity. Normally I would click on an activity, uh, claim that task, uh, wait for the user interface to pop up so that I could go through that activity and decide you know, what, um, uh, what the status is of the activity uh, perhaps looking at who worked on the activity, um, reaching out to experts like I did a, a few minutes ago to collaborate with someone, and then eventually click a button like uh, approved or, or a verified. If it's really more of a laser focus activity, and let me go ahead and reassign this activity back to the group since I'm not really working on it anymore. If it's more of a laser focused activity, I can drill down onto it and you know, say, uh, you know, looks, uh, looks good, and, and then press an approve button right here without even opening it up. Right, without having to claim it and wait for this activity to uh, paint the user interface for it. So it does a, uh, an inline claim and approve to make things lickety-split, uh, for lack of a better phrase. Now, let me go ahead and go back to my full inbox by uh, clearing out that search. I've got 44 results. Let me narrow it down into another area, order. Uh, so I have 29 activities related to my order process or ordering. Um, uh, let me uh, add to that search uh, iPhone. So I have uh, five activities that are related to orders for iPhones. If I click on these activities to just look at some of the preview details, what I can see is that um, uh, that I have an order for Walmart, Target, uh, Best Buy, Costco. Um, so a number of orders for different customers. If I further narrow the search string to uh, Target, now I can see the one order for iPhones that is destined for Target. Okay, so the other thing that is, I think, uh, um, flexibly pleasing about this search is that it's a, it's a sticky search. Um, by that I mean if I drill down into this iPhone order, uh, or let me, let me actually go into an iPad order that's even a, a bit more interesting. 
I'll go into an iPad order, iPad 2 cover order. Um, if I go into this iPad 2 cover order, let's say into the uh, process diagram uh, or the instance, let's, let's view the, the task or the instance, I can see who worked, all the people that worked on this and, and completed the activities leading up to my part of the process. I can view where I am in the process. So the exact same picture that I drew in the process designer is optionally available to participants of the process. Again, part of our social experience. So I can see, you know, this guy Bill Hahn, uh, who's a BPM solution architect, created this order. Um, I can see that there are four vendors that bid on this order. Um, and uh, for instance, this uh, vendor. Uh, vendors one, two, and three that look suspiciously like my children. Um, vendor one has completed 60 uh, vendor quotes. He might be somebody good to reach out to if, if I need some advice on, on completing uh, vendor quotes. Um, we can see uh, the managers that have touched this order, Beth, uh, OF Manager one, and Bill. And if, uh, if I need help working on this, I, I've got my expert group right here in the, um, uh, in, in the process. And look at this. We've gone through a rejection path four times. So I can see uh, the people that worked on this um, in each one of the, the four rework um, uh, paths as I branched back through this process uh, through a manager rejection and, and worked through this analyst uh, select fulfillment option. So <clears throat> the process diagram is now even uh, higher fidelity. Uh, so that we can see the picture of the process and the people that, that worked on the process and pertinent information about the kind of work that got done. And when I get back to my work uh, inbox, look at this. The search is sticky. So if I use this search as a filter uh, to customize my inbox and look at only what I care about, I am efficiently um, able to return to that filtered inbox. Okay, so I think that's a... a I think the search capability is not only very useful and very quick and extremely granular, uh, but also um, uh, from a human factor standpoint, it, it works the way I want it to work. It's, it's sticky uh, and works, I would say, more like a filter than just a search. All right, so um, in addition to that um, coverage of the new process portal that uh, gives us uh, a more efficient and higher fidelity way of, of traversing our work, um, you know, including uh, things like uh, being able to access a list of users in my group uh, with uh, type ahead filtering, which is more productive and uh, more efficient than um, the ways that we've reassigned work in the past. There's lots of trinkets, lots of bells and whistles in, in how we've tried to enhance this to make it uh, more efficient and, and more usable. Um, the dashboards that we've seen in the past uh, and custom searches as well as custom reports are uh, organized into this part of the user interface. Uh, so I can get to, for instance, the, um, the classic uh, My Team Performance and My Performance dashboards. Uh, the out-of-the-box dashboards that uh, tap into the automatically collected metrics for the process are a, um, a focus area for the um, uh, uh, the upcoming releases later this year and early next year, so uh, look for continued enhancements in the end user experience. Um, we see uh, that we have a clear view uh, of um, which activities are on task, uh, on track, at risk, and overdue, on track in blue, at risk in orange, yellowish, uh, and overdue in red. Um, I can see when activities are going to go overdue in the future. And I see the pieces of the pie. Let's say I want to focus on those at-risk activities. Th this is actually learned over time using straightforward uh, built-in algorithms. We monitor how long uh, people and systems take to complete activities and then predict um, the likelihood that activities that are in flight are at risk of going overdue. Uh, so we learn that over time. Um, and of course, you can set using the property sheets of the uh, process designer, uh, you get to set uh, the, de the default due dates, uh, as well as fully dynamic due dates for, uh, for activities, uh, like this manager escalation is due in one hour, right? That could be hours, minutes, or days. Or I can make that fully dynamic uh, and, and, and determined at runtime based upon uh, maybe if it's a bigger order and a more important customer, 
um, I want to escalate it, you know, more aggressively, right? So I'll base it off, off of process data that I've defined for the process and then make this totally dynamic at runtime for each order that flows through the process. So it's straightforward to understand where this comes from and, and, and then the orange part is, is uh, calculated and dynamic for us. We can see then the work distributed across our team uh, and then perhaps based upon that view of the work distributed across our team, we might choose to select some of these activities, change the priority or reassign them to different people uh, on the team you know, that are maybe in a better position to get, get the job done right now. Um, we can also get a view of the overall process performance. Uh, so if I take a look at the order fulfillment uh, process performance, I can see all of the work going through the process with turning information over days, weeks, and months of, uh, of what's closed and what's in flight. Um, I can see uh, the highest uh, volume activities like manager approval, create order, get vendor responses, uh, select fulfillment option, and, and what the volume and velocity of those are. Uh, and I can even click on uh, I can even click on the uh, parts of these uh, uh, reports or dashboards and, and drill down into the activities that um, are on track, at risk, or overdue. So these are the, the uh, dashboards, um, we call them scoreboards, or dashboards that, uh, that work the same with any process that you build and deploy. Now you can also build process-specific ad hoc reports. So for instance, and, and this is in my opinion a... Um, a very powerful dimension of the product. Let me go ahead and select uh, a specific process and then drill down into that process and look for some of the data that's flowing through that process. Um, and I'll choose, for instance, to chart out, to build a custom report for, um, uh, for the total number of orders by customer. So let me show me the volume of orders by customer and do that for a simple pie chart. Okay? And you can see that I'm able to build this custom report very, very quickly with a little bit of mouse aerobics. Now, I could build this in the same, in, in, a, in almost exactly the same fashion in the process designer <clears throat> in anticipation of people needing this report, which is exactly what was done on this select vendor screen. If you see on this select vendor screen, we have a, uh, uh, a, a, um, a report that goes on here, and you see that when we run this uh, and go through this screen, that uh, in Process Designer, when I'm building this out, uh, and I get to that that third screen, it actually has a uh, a live report. Um, uh, it has a live report in it, uh, and I guess the better place to do that would actually be with a, a live running process instance. Um, uh, we can see here that uh, in the process portal, if I'm working with a new order uh, and step through that new order. Of course, we need a live running instance of an order in order for the live report to work. Uh, we'll choose a, a new order and go ahead and progress to the next screen. We can see on the third screen that there is a, a report that's trying to be built here. Uh, maybe it has something to do with my browser. So I'll just go ahead and continue with this. Uh, you saw the report before. Um, it, it showed up as a... Uh, uh, horizontal bar chart. Uh, so we can build these dynamic reports as I've done here, uh, maybe changing this to a, um, uh, a, uh, a bar chart. Uh, so I can see very clearly that uh, Target is the highest volume customer. Now where, where this data comes from, you can see this list of data here, material description, priority, quantity, vendor price, customer. In the process, we get to choose. Uh, we get to choose um, which process variables are being tracked for um, performance tracking and search capability. So, for instance, in the process portal, when I go to a uh, my inbox and I click on uh, activities, we can see these these highlights of details. Let's look at some orders. If I go to uh, if I go to orders and drill down on a particular activity, I can see I can actually see the uh, the highlights of details for um, the uh, order elements that are being tracked or process. So now that the web conference is caught back up, let me let me make that point again. You see in the process here that I've got data. I switch from the diagram view uh, to the variables view. 
In the variables view, I can see the data defined for the process. I could point and click at web services as an example and have these data structures generated for me. Or I could have a dialogue with the business about what do you call uh, the data elements of an order and uh, describe this or you know, do all of the above. Have a business discussion, describe it in business terms, uh, access IT systems, generate the data, and map these two together, meet in the middle. Regardless of how you define the data, we make it straightforward and quick to do that. Once you've defined the data for a business process, um, then you can use it for building out visual screens, the user interfaces, the coaches. Uh, you can use it for uh, flowing the process. You can also visit this data and decide which data elements you're going to track for performance tracking and or business data search. Uh, so if I want to be able to search on data that's flowing through instances of the process, in this case orders, like I was doing in the process portal, I might, I, I, I should select the business data search. If I want to be able to <coughs> uh, uh, build reports based upon the state information, the state of this data, the, the value of customer name, priority, quantity, and so forth, like I did for total quantity of orders by customer, because I checked this checkbox for performance tracking, I was able to build a longer or shorter list of process variables that are tracked. And there's the punchline. Now when I get to building out a custom report, this list of business data is longer or shorter just because I checked or unchecked checkboxes when I was designing the process. I think it's very powerful. I think this is a, a very powerful general purpose building block that you can use when you're building out a process application to make your process more usable, more searchable, uh, give you better metrics, not only for building these custom reports, uh, but also for analyzing the process. Because in fact, if we look at the conclusion here of this, this, this tour of, of uh, IBM BPM, um, let's look at some of the, uh, some very simple example reports. Uh, you'll notice here that um, uh, if I look at um, some example reports, uh, these are examples of reports focused on the service level agreements for how and performance by, by vendor, by customer. You can see Target is, is, uh, has uh, bigger issues with how long it's taking me to fulfill orders. A response time by product. Um, you can see here in the bottom right hand corner, I have listed out a custom report that shows my primary activities, vendor responses, manager approval, and so forth, and, and the average wait times. And it looks like manager approval is taking longer than most other activities to complete. And if I'd like to drill down on that, I could visit in the process designer this third perspective called optimizer. And in the optimizer perspective, <clears throat> what that does for me is it gives me a view of, uh, of, um, of the process from the perspective of um, performance uh, metrics. So if I click on Optimizer uh, and uh, select um, the data set I'm interested in, like for instance, just show me all the available data that's been automatically tracked in this process. I press the Calculate button and in a few seconds it has tapped into that shared process model uh, and the, the metrics that we've collected for it. And I can verify here, yeah, you know what it looks like? Manager approval is taken on average 17 hours, 44 minutes, and 33 seconds. That's the average wait time. And this analyst activity is taken on average 11 and a half hours. Um, now, th there's actually a, a, a lot of metrics that are gathered for, uh, for, for the process, and, and we can set things like uh, KPIs and thresholds uh, and expectations on uh, on how we want it to perform. We can do simulations and what-if analysis. And when, regardless of whether we're doing what-if analysis uh, or, her, or historical analysis on real data that's automatically collected for us, this view, this optimizer view, works the same way. I'm tapping into the data that was automatically collected on how the process was actually used. And I can switch this view to, say, show me, instead of average value, show me the percent of instances outside range. In other words, Show me the percentage of time this takes longer than the business wants it to take. Um, I can ask the business, how long should manager approval take? And the business uh, experts might say, well, it's supposed to take a day. We'd really like it to take uh, six hours or less. I can take that simple answer, six hours. I can plug it into the property sheet of um, the process designer. And once I plug it into the property sheet of the process designer, then uh, in the optimizer perspective, it shows me 
it automatically calculates for me the percentage of time is taking longer than the business wants it to, 52% of the time. I can also take a look at, uh, say, the path, uh, the traffic through this process. I can see that 49% of the time, uh, orders are actually approved. And when I click on that link, I can see the variables, the process data that I asked to be collected, the quantity, the vendor, the price, the status, here's approved. If I click on this rejection link, I can see here all of the orders that were rejected. Um, so the data is at my fingertips. <clears throat> I could share this data with the broader analyst team. So for people that don't have this process designer tool on their desktop, I can share it with them as raw data. And then I could use normal spreadsheet jacking techniques as an example to take a look at specific issues. Like let's say uh, we are having complaints about the Majestic supplier uh, for our customers. Or um, for all of the vendors, um, <clears throat> uh, Best Buy is incredibly uh, uh, agitated. Um, and so let's look at all the Best Buyers. We, we can share this data and look at it and look for patterns of activity. Like let's like say we could spot patterns. Imagine we could spot patterns um, uh, related to manager approval where we knew that with high probability managers are going to reject orders anyway. Why let it sit in their inbox and then um, pay them a lot of money as, as one of our key managers, right, to do a high-touch manual approval if we know that they're going to um, reject it anyway? Why not auto-reject it or auto-approve it? So one of the things we can do with this data besides provide you this general purpose analysis capability. Um, and, and oh, by the way, let me, let me go ahead and, and, and sift this down a bit. Instead of all the data, let's just look at all the orders that have completed, not the ones in flight, but just the completed ones. Um, and you notice that when I look at a different data set, now you can see, well, for all the completed orders, 100% of the completed orders made it through the process, and 35% of them were rejected. So now, based on the completed orders, uh, give me some... Uh, you know, can you spot some um, patterns of activity? Like, for instance, uh, if I take a look at um, wait time uh, and, uh, and, and zero in on um, the average wait time for managers uh, and, uh, and look at manager approval, we can see that there's some guidance that says, well, have you thought about escalating this activity if there's a lot of wait time? Or how does this compare to other times? Is rework making it high? You know, general purpose guidance. So there's also this uh, bypass wizard. If I use that, it will actually look for patterns of activity for me. This variable called status, which I probably should have called approval, um, is, is where I store that it approved or rejected decision. So when the manager clicks or unche either checks or unchecks the checkbox called approval in that user interface, it sets the status variable to uh, approved or rejected. So now if I look for the patterns of activity, I can see when it's a certain combination of uh, product and price level and so forth, uh, it gets rejected. Uh, when it's a certain combination of urgency and price level, uh, it, gets, it gets approved. If I ask for guidance on potential business rules for that, we can see that, well, you know, 100% of the time when it's a certain product, uh, urgency, and price level, <clears throat> it gets approved. If I want to experiment with these um, situations. Let me click finish here and watch carefully what happens in the process model. It actually adds a couple of things to my process model. What, what I can see here is it added a, uh, a bypass rule uh, and, a, and an auto bypass gateway. So I can, in a risk-free fashion, because I have this built-in version control, in a risk-free fashion I can experiment with these patterns of process improvement where it will automatically pass it to the manager for high touch when needed or automatically bypass the manager when we uh, think they're going to approve it or reject it anyway. And the way that it decides that, if I drill down into this manager approval bypass rule, is it has built out for me a decision table. And this decision table that it's built out includes a rows in the, in the table based upon customer, product name, price, and priority. And for each row in the table, it's going to either automatically approve or automatically reject um, the, uh, 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 the order uh, to auto bypass the manager. Now, this, when, I'm, when I'm using this, um, uh, I can actually um, uh, do a number of things. I can base it off of uh, business action language. 
Uh, so we've built into uh, ver starting in version 7.5, um, taken just a little bit of our iLog heritage operational decision management capabilities and built it into um, uh, IBM BPM for decision tables, as you saw here, uh, as well as for uh, business action language or natural language statements. So therefore, any uh, um, variables in the um, business process like customer and so forth can be used to build a natural language statement uh, or business rule. Uh, and we can also build uh, um, decision tables. Or we can reach out to a, um, a, a WODM, Webster Operational Decision Management, uh, which used to be called ILOG, um, business rule management system, and drag and drop in uh, business rules. Uh, I'll call this ILOG uh, WODM business rule. And uh, you'll notice that when we do that, it's configurable. Uh, so I can connect to a, uh, an iLog or ODM server. Once I'm connected to that server, then I would get a list of the rules in that server and, and then call out to that server. And you'll notice that when I, uh, when I, when I do this, I have a, you know, a rich palette. So that's a little bit of the, um, the, the, the range of what's possible in, um, in IBM BPM. Hopefully that's given you some good food for thought for those of you that haven't seen IBM uh, BPM in action before, as well as for those of you that um, have seen it, uh, I tried to cover what's new in version 8 with this end-to-end -end demo. Um, as you notice, uh, I did cover a fair amount of what's new in the social portal, uh, some of the things that are new in process designer and process center. Uh, I wasn't able to show the mobile access, but you can go to the uh, Apple App Store and download the, just search for IBM BPM. Uh, and then there are slides in my um, version 8 slide deck on ibmbpmdemos.com that cover uh, the entire inventory, including uh, the content management enhancements. Um, uh, highlights include, you know, as I mentioned, that new coach designer, we can build user interfaces, uh, we can build the end user experience as either uh, heritage coaches or new coaches. In other words, when I'm using the palette <coughs> to build out uh, the user interface or coaches, there's a new coach on the top of the palette and there is a heritage coach on the bottom of the palette. Uh, the uh, heritage coaches work just like um, we're used to them working and the, uh, the new coach at the top of the palette uh, is used when um, uh, you would like to uh, build out these composite user interfaces. The reason we kept both is because some people are used to the old style uh, and others are uh, adapting the, the new style of, of composite UI uh, development. Um, those are some of the highlights. Hopefully that helps. And don't forget you can go to ibmbpmdemos.com to get this presentation uh, as well as the live recorded demo uh, scenarios. There's a lot of good resources on this website, uh, downloadable as well as via the YouTube channel. So at this point, um, uh, I'll open it up for questions.